This is the Microsoft Cloud Show, episode 56. Today, we're going to talk to a couple user interface and design people about their experience in working in the cloud, specifically Office 365, recorded live November 12th, 2014. Welcome to the Microsoft Cloud Show, the only place to stay up to date on everything going on in the Microsoft Cloud world, including Windows Azure, Office 365, SharePoint, Exchange, Link, and related technologies. Just the information, no marketing, no BS. I'm Andrew Connell. And I'm Chris Johnson. And we're just two dudes telling you how we see it. I am here today with uh, four other people with me that are more in the design and user experience space around uh, and, the, and on the web stuff, which is more like we're going to talk about Office 365. And because a lot of this is all SharePoint related, uh, we are going to be um, most of the branding or UX customizations come out of the SharePoint space. So it is going to be a little bit on the SharePoint cloud focus. But before we dive into that, I, I do want to kind of uh, take a second here and talk a little bit about um, some stuff we did last week. So in our previous episode, episode 55, that came out on November the 11th of 2014, at the beginning of the show, aside from the funny stuff that if anybody hasn't heard it, you ought to go take a listen to it, at least for the first five minutes, uh, where CJ and I got a hold of some helium balloons after a party was wrapped up at a, at a restaurant in Bellevue, Washington, uh, and we decided to kind of go a little crazy. The funny part was is that we originally were going to have that get published on Jeremy Thake's um, Office 365 developer podcast, and about halfway through our little having fun time, uh, we all kind of decided that there was no way that this could come from a Microsoft brand. So instead, we just took it and threw it into our show at the very beginning. But another thing from that show is that I mentioned that we talked to three different groups of people, developers, IT pros, and UX people about how the cloud is affecting their day-to-day -day life. And the astute listener of the show would pick up that we only end up replaying it for two people, the developer and the IT pro audience. And the reason for that is because my microphone completely corrupted the 170 or 80 meg uh, 20 plus minute file that uh, uh, of our discussion of the panel of the four people that I have collected today on Skype. Um, and uh, we lost the entire discussion, which was very disappointing because we had a good discussion. So we're redoing it today. We're making a whole episode out of it today. Uh, that'll be that's coming out as here is episode 56. This will be nice because we I did feel like we were a bit time boxed last week. We were trying to keep it short so the episode didn't get super long. Uh, but today, because we're dedicating it just for this one topic, we've got a lot more stuff that we can kind of go into in a little bit more extent. So with that, let me uh, introduce uh, who we have here today. So um, Kathy, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself, ladies first. Sure thing. My name's Kathy Dew. I'm a SharePoint MVP uh, focused on user experience design based out of Huntsville, Alabama. Thanks, Kathy. Uh, how about you, Jesper? Want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Hi, I'm Jesper. I'm an Office 65 MVP from Amsterdam, the Netherlands. Um, I'm very humbled to be in this company because I'm not a branding master like a couple other people out here, but I do deal with a lot of UX questions from customers. So. I do a, think I have some valuable input, I hope. <laughs> I hope so, too. Otherwise, we're going to throw you off the show. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> cool. Mark, how about you? I'm Mark Anderson. I'm in Boston, Mass. That's in the United States of America. Jasper is our foreign representative. <laughs> um, I, I wouldn't call myself a brander either, but I do spend a lot of time thinking about UX, and I implement brands a lot for uh, clients. So that's, that's probably why I'm here. Cool. And Randy, how about you? Just down the road from me. Yes, down in the uh, heat of Orlando. Uh, so I'm Randy Driscoll. I'm a SharePoint uh, server MVP as well. I've, I'm focused on uh, UI, UX in, in SharePoint, and uh, I lead a dev and UX team uh, for SharePoint at Rackspace. Oh, very cool. So I guess uh, our panel then, what we have is, we um, would it be fair to say that I have we have two, I guess in the, in the most traditional sense of the word, two web designers slash just graphic designers and Randy and Kathy, and then with Mark and Jesper, we implement brands, we do customization, but not so much on the design side. Is that fair to say, everybody? Yeah, that's I think so. so. About right. Okay, and then you've got me, which is just a developer that basically makes it hell for all four of you. <laughs> so what we want to talk about today is uh, an extension of what we talked about last week, which was a, a discussion on how is this whole move to the cloud or cloud life, how is it affecting um, each one of you uh, in the day-to-day -day jobs? And so last week, like I said, we talked to developers, and we talked to IT pros, um, but and while it's affecting each one of us, each one of these different audiences or disciplines in different ways, it seems like one of the most contentious places that there have been a lot of challenges has been around this space, around the design side and around the UX side. 
So um, I know earlier this year, um, Mark and I have actually had a conversation about it um, on a previous episode of the show. I guess this kind of works out from in Mark's favor too, because while he was a guest on the previous show, he's actually getting another guest entry on this show. So by far, just ticking it up a little bit more, raising the bar for the most frequent guest uh, in the second slot. So, but we talked about earlier this year here about you know, what is the, the challenges that we're facing? Because we had a lot of things happen at the beginning of 2014 or an early part of 2014, where Microsoft was making changes to Office 365, primarily around the CSS and around the master page that was really messing up a lot of people. And there's been a lot of, uh, uh, of learning on both sides. So I guess let me, I'm gonna pitch it to, to Kathy to start out with. And why don't you kind of explain what we're talking about when I say like, um, uh, there's been some challenges or what things people are facing today in this space. Yeah, I think for for me and from my perspective, one of the, the things that's been a real challenge with this is the real fast paced movement that Microsoft is doing with Office 365. And over the years on all the on-premises versions of SharePoint, it's always been a challenge to make SharePoint not look like SharePoint. But it's one of the most common requests from customers is to apply their identity and their brand to their SharePoint implementation. And with SharePoint Online, it's the same thing. It's still a web portal. And so they still want to have their brand applied to it. But the constant changes and fast-paced movement from Microsoft uh, makes it a challenge because they're needing to edit and make changes to the master page to add in additional script references, to add in additional content placeholders, things like that, to make sure that their new features they're releasing come into place, which makes it a challenge for us as brand implementers, because when they change a set of CSS classes, um, it's obviously not something that's set into our pieces. And so we have to constantly stay on our toes to keep adapting the brand as new releases happen. Cool, cool. Yeah, so you talked about a little bit of the the first release thing here. Randy, you want to explain a little bit more like what this means when we talk about first release or flight its controls and stuff? Yeah, certainly. Yeah, you know, and it's, it's interesting because they that's sort of something that Microsoft gave us, um, you know, a button in O3C5 to hit and say, I want to get the first release of things as they come out. And so at first glance, you may think, okay, well, that's cool. I can just set up my tenant to have that, but my uh, production tenant, you know, won't get those things. And then that way I can prepare all my stuff and have it ready to go and not be sort of surprised. But the reality of it is not everything gets uh, included in just the first release. Like if they do a, a hot fix or something like that, it's going to go out whether you have first release or not. And so it's my understanding that like they're on a two-week update schedule. And the only things that would be um, included in the first release are things that are in like the flighted controls, which if you look at the Seattle.master, there's areas in it that have like flighted controls. And that's where that's where the new stuff comes out. So it's still quite a challenge to uh, to keep up with these things, and even even with that, you know, you would need to have to go out and look, you know, download Seattle.master all the time and see what's changed and things like that. And so, it could definitely be a big surprise um, as big parts of the master page change, maybe CSS classes, IDs change, that kind of thing. Cool. Yeah. So when you you talk about some of these changes and stuff, I know that we got this big thing at the top in Office 365 that uh, Microsoft likes to call it the sweet bar, which this whole sweet thing always kind of cracks me up because it's you know, one place they call it the sweet bar, yet everything is all tenant based and everything. So Jasper, you want to talk a little bit about here about the sweet bar and what kind of challenges we have with this? Yeah, yeah. they call it sweet, but I wouldn't give it the name sweet because it doesn't always do sweet things. It's kind of a lame <laughs> joke. <laughs> it's probably the worst joke you ever heard. But uh, no, like we, for example, I think it must have been like two months ago, um, we were working on one of our customers and they we changed the color from, uh, I think from blue to black. And what happened since is that like at least two or three times, the, the color went back to blue. Mm. And then the customer's like, hey, what, what's going on? I thought we made it black. And we're like, oh, well, we didn't really knew this was going to happen. So apparently in the background, there are changes being made we're not really aware of. So it causes some issues. And also what Randy kind of mentioned about, uh, you know, can, you can use first release. There's still a lot of stuff changing in the background without, you know, using the first release feature. Um, I believe the sweet bar used to be a bit smaller, but they made it wider. 
And then that kind of caused an issue with the side action bar that became totally black. I don't know if you guys saw that. It must have been like a month and a half ago, two months ago. Mm -hmm. So that's also like really, yeah, just weird for end users, right? They're just doing their work and out of nothing, that side action bar is totally black. And that, I think it took like one or two days. I think Mark saw that as well. So, yeah, that makes makes it difficult for us to kind of, you know, I understand that changes need to be done, but it would be nice if we can kind of... Uh, uh, know what's going to come. So we know there's going to be a change in the code. So we know the color is going to go back to blue. But then, you know, after after it's been applied, we immediately five minutes later can change it back to black, for example. Yeah, I, I, it's funny you say that too. You, you brought up that one challenge that we had or that one uh, change where the sweet bar, when they, when they got it a little bit um, thicker or taller, however you want to say it, and then that change, there was some caching or, or there's an issue with like some CSS and uh, a bunch of people saw that on Twitter. I know that Mark, um, there's a Yammer group that uh, Office 365 and SharePoint MVPs are um, a member of. Uh, it's not a public group, it's a private group that we share with Microsoft uh, for all the listeners. And I know Mark raised it at the beginning and then there was a bunch of people kind of chimed in. Um, watching the reaction to that was really cool with Microsoft. Um, another time too, where we saw the sweet bar was actually uh, taking a very long time to load, or relatively speaking, taking a very long time to load. Um, and they addressed it pretty quick here. But it is still a phase of where we're learning how to work better with them. So, uh, Kathy, you wanted you wanted to jump in here and say something. Yeah, um, just to kind of go through it a little bit, one of the things that Microsoft has done to try to address some of these issues is they've now provided a tenant ability to theme that sweet bar. And so they released that about a month and a half ago now where you could do that tenant-wide. And you could change the color and add your own logo into that sweet bar. Um, of course, it's it's never exactly what our, our customers are looking for because next to your logo, it still puts a little powered by Office 365 logo next to it. Um, and so they released that and, and I, I myself published a blog post on it. And then the very day I hit publish on my blog post for how to do it and how it applies, they released the idea of the new app launcher that's coming out. So that's just one more change to the sweet bar and how that works in even just a two month period around features they've announced themselves. Yeah, it's I guess when you talk about the thing that they just that they added to us, the ability to theme the the sweet bar about a month and a half ago. What I guess we're recording this in the middle of November 2014. So what would that be? November, October, sometimes September-ish time frame of 2014. Right. It, you know, it's funny, we said this. I know that I was talking to some of the people from Microsoft last week. I made this analogy, and when we said it during the podcast or during our failed recording last week, and I, I don't want this to sound too harsh, but it still feels like we're in this phase of almost like this weird kind of a war where the external customer for Office 365, we're still trying to learn exactly how to work with Microsoft. Microsoft is trying to learn how to work with us. And both sides, it feels like we're in this battle. And right now we finally have gotten to a bit of like this ceasefire to where we're trying to figure out now how do we move forward from this? So it's, it's a little bit challenging here, but um, you know, it's, I think we're still in that weird kind of like toddler phase of trying to figure out how best to work with each other. Mark, you had you had something you wanted to say on, around what Kathy was just saying too. Yeah, I think I think you're right about the war thing. I mean, it's it's a friendly war in a sense, but still, it's there's some skirmishes going on. I think you know what what's happening here is that the legacy of SharePoint being a developer platform is really catching up to us. You know, for for quite a few versions now, we've we've been used to. Some, doing some very heavy lifting to make the UI do what we want to do. And I think now that Microsoft is running this thing as a service and we're seeing how the service uh, UI is evolving, we need to come up with new ways to work with it. And I think that they're hearing those messages loud and clear, at least in the conversations that I'm having with them. So you know, it, this will evolve to a better place, but it's going to be really un uncomfortable, I think, for quite a while because we're just not able to do the things that, that we're typically used to doing. It's not a developer platform as much as an end user platform on Office 365. It's a service, which, may, you know, all of this makes sense, and there are huge benefits to that. But it's a change for all of us. So, again, we're going to have to sort of learn how this, how this can work. I think that any suggestions we can give, you know, as a community can give Microsoft about, you know, here's maybe a different way to think about theming or, or branding or, 
you know, UI enhancements. Um, you know, I know Kathy has some great ideas around this. It's going to really change things. And the nice thing is that they're really listening and they're trying to move very quickly, like they did with that sweet bar problem I pointed out. Yeah, yeah. And that's, and it's funny, you know, it's interesting you said that. I definitely want to come back to what Kathy's suggestion is. I really like Kathy's suggestion. It's something I definitely want to talk about um, in just a few minutes here. But one thing that's interesting when we've kind of give a, a we haven't really talked about so much just yet is that you know one of the reasons that I see that we keep having these problems, you know, a lot of customers don't really understand why Microsoft is making changes to Office 365 that do seem to be at, in one sense fairly arbitrary. But I think that, you know, let's talk a little bit about like why are they doing this? So you know, like I think from from one point of view, what they're doing is they're trying to add new capabilities and features. Um, to Office 365, things like an updated sweep bar, adding this thing called the app launcher to the sweep bar as well. And if someone's gone and customized their master pages, then they can't get those kind of updates. Um, the, the other changes that they're having is that, you know, they're coming to find that uh, there are major, uh, uh, They've seen significant things with hosting SharePoint on their own. This is it, you know, Office 365 in one sense is incredibly ironic and comical in the sense that, uh, you know, for so long they've been shipping SharePoint and telling us how to deploy it and how to manage it and stuff. And then all of a sudden, Microsoft, it's their turn to host and manage SharePoint in Office 365. And they're kind of looking around like, holy crap, this is really hard. So it's kind of funny as you see this kind of come in, uh, I'm figuring this stuff out. It's, so it's not, these changes that they're doing are not so much just arbitrary. They are things that they're doing to try and better the platform, but they're finding that, hey, these things that customers have done on-prem, they just don't work so much in a multi-tenant or hosted environment and also facilitating Microsoft with the ability to innovate and add features in, in a way. Randy, you want to jump in here and say something? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you you totally nailed it, right? I mean, it's, it's hilarious in that, you know, Microsoft's now sort of having to eat their own dog food as far as hosting SharePoint and dealing with, you know, problem people like myself and Kathy, et cetera, who go in there and change the UI and, and change how, how things work, right? And so I think, I think, like you said, one of the big issues is the way that they had us customize the UI of SharePoint was to go in and edit master pages and things like that. And like, the funny thing is like the master page, like I always say, it's like the glue that holds the site together. But I mean, it's literally got, you know, controls that get registered at the top to bring in all of the SharePoint functionality. And so when they want to add new things, like they want to add this app launcher or whatever, they don't really have a good way of injecting those things without, um, you know, just updating the master page. And so, like you said, if you've, if you've done any customization to the master page, like let's say you just copied seattle.master and just added a line for jQuery, then you're not going to get these new updates that they're putting in there. And so I think, in some cases, it might be you just don't get the update. In other cases, it might be that your UI breaks and you have to go in and, and fix things. So I think, you know, in, in discussion about, like, your, your war concept, I definitely think there's sort of, like, lines are starting to be drawn where they say, like, we own the sweet bar. You know, please don't mess with that. And then, like, the, it's up to us to sort of haggle over what, what things we can and can't uh, sort of – customizing the master page without breaking things. Yeah, that's yeah, it's true. It, it's, it's just, it's a bit of a challenge. So, okay, so let's talk a little bit now. Let's try and pivot this a little bit. Let's talk about like, we've got these challenges. We've we kind of explained a little bit about some of the pains that we've had. So today, as much as we have liked, um, I know I've been on this on this side as well. We've, we've all complained. We've all kind of figured out, you know, explained to Microsoft, here's how you're hurting us and da da this kind of stuff. But, you know, it is their ball and they're gonna do what they want with it. And they are being very responsive to the community and trying to understand better about what they need to have done. But then they're saying, hey, look, you gotta give us, some, you gotta sit there and you gotta work with us too. There's things that we have to do. So what kinds of things are you guys telling your customer? What are you doing specifically? And what kinds of things are you telling your customers today when they say, we want a custom brand in SharePoint? You know, are you going and saying, uh, no, I'm absolutely not going to do that, or yes, I can do that, or yes, I'm doing it, but here are all the things that you need to consider, and stuff may break, and there's no warranty or whatever. So that just that's just an example. So what are you guys doing with your customers today? Mark, I'll let you go first on this one. Sure. Um, you know, I think I think what we're seeing with things like Delve, um, you know, I think that's that's sort of our first public view of where the UI is going in SharePoint or not, not SharePoint really, but Office 365. And I think, I think the conversations I'm going to have with clients going forward now that I've seen things like this railed experience that they have with Dell, that's a phrase that they're using, which I think is an odd one, but we're, we're on the rails there. We can't go off the rails in the UI. So 
with these experiences that they're going to be bringing, like Delve, and that's that's the only one, like I said, that we can see, we understand that that we're not going to have as much control over the UI. So I think the important thing is to have these good conversations with people who want to go to Office 365 now and say, you know, this this isn't this isn't really just SharePoint in the sky. This is a different service that you're signing up to. So you need to think about what UI customizations actually matter to your organization. That's a really tough discussion to have with a marketing person because they want lots of pixels to move around. But I think if you're going to Office 365, you might need to sort of back off a bit and, and do much lighter branding. Or if you need to do heavy branding, then back off on Office 365 altogether. And I know that Microsoft would love to hear me say that, but it's not right <laughs> for everybody. And the UI now becomes a part of that decision process. It's not just about data sovereignty and, and uh, you know functionality that you may or may not have by going to Office 365. The UI is also part of that sort of contract with, with between the user and, and Microsoft that they don't have as much control over as they do on-premises. Yeah, I have to admit, like when I was still doing a lot of on-premises projects, I always got a little bit terrified when a graphic design came back. And it's like, oh man, because especially if companies, they used to hire like other graphical designers who had no idea how SharePoint worked. It was always waiting for a disaster though but at least on premises you had all the control in your own hands because you had access to the server you know you were controlling the updates and it's just so different in SharePoint Online these days and I, like lately it really opened up my eyes especially with all the releases being pushed through that it's just what Mark says it's really a service and you, you just kind of you're in for the ride like and it's you, you have to give up a little bit of control and this is also where we have to really advise customers saying like okay you know you can do your customizations but keep Keep in mind, there can be changes coming ahead that kind of can affect this. So I always try to keep the customizations to a minimum. You know, they always want to have the logo and some colors. That's okay, but try not to go, you know, too crazy. You know, I don't want to say too negative because, especially with SharePoint Online, you just don't know if a change by Microsoft can affect, you know, all the. Let's say you put a day's work in, like creating like a UX change or something, and then the next day an update is done, and your work is kind of like messed up. That would be, you know, such a shame, though. Yep, and. Uh... I think it's it's funny because I think back to like SharePoint conference earlier this year and you know Microsoft was okay with me kind of giving a message out there that if people want to do design manager and change their master page up and all this kind of stuff it's all great for for SharePoint online just like it is in the farm but now if you look at kind of what they're saying like if you look at the patterns and practices site there's a PowerPoint that's released with that where they kind of start suggesting that people not do custom master pages for like basic team sites and SPO and if they are going to do like an intranet portal, that they really consider it almost like a tax where they need to think about, you know, if I'm going to make a custom master page for this, you know, I'm going to have to go back in in, um, in a month and maybe make changes and then again in another month and make changes. And so what I'm recommending to customers is that, you know, if they're doing basic team collaboration sites in SharePoint Online, keep it simple, use composed looks, use composed, th uh, use themes, but you know, if you want to do something really custom branded, you know, I'm recommending that, you know, they go to uh, on-prem and a farm-based install. And if they kind of insist upon being in SharePoint Online for that, they really need to have sort of the budgets and the and the time to understand that, you know, things are going to be changing and they're going to have to update stuff accordingly. Yeah, I think with, with a lot of customers that, that I work with, they're already willing to sign up for that tax, as you just said, Randy, you know, they, they're being advised. One of the things I'm telling people is yes, we can customize the look and feel of SharePoint online, but do understand that you're going to have customizations that are for a feature set based on the date that we finish the project. New features that get released will not be customized and you'll have to do continuous updates to get those through. And, um, you know, it's just one of those things I kind of feel like at this stage, you know, much like what AC was saying before, you know, we are kind of in that stage of learning and growing and I'm, I'm still kind of in the toddler stage where I'm still learning what the meaning no, the word no means. And um, to me, the word no doesn't necessarily, even though I've been told don't customize the master page, doesn't necessarily mean don't customize the master page. Um, it's just a matter of understanding what the challenges are and what the ramifications are if you do decide to go down that customization route. Yeah, it, it, it's challenging here, right? Because, you know, we've got you've got customers that want to do all this customization, you know, and they've been... 
especially for people who have been in this space, who have been in the in the SharePoint space on prem, uh, going back, and they've been they're migrating to three sixty five. I think that those people have the bigger challenge because they're the ones that have been conditioned to saying it's okay to do what you've been doing. But if you've got customers that are net new coming into 365, I guess it might be a bit easier for, to condition them. As you look at other hosted services like a Salesforce or like a CRM online or something like that, and customers don't really have so much of the challenge or the frustration around that. They're a little more open to saying that, yeah, I'm, I am on this experience that is more on Rails and where Microsoft is providing a experience, you just kind of adapt to it. So... I mean, we've done a good job here, I think, explaining, you know, what the challenges have been and how we approach it today. I like what all of you said, where it's, you know, kind of the classic uh, consultant experience, which is, you know, your job is not just to say yes and do whatever the customer wants, but you also have a, a bit of, at least in my mind, you have a bit of a responsibility in saying that, you know, educating the customer and giving them the most information and letting them choose the right path forward. But let's go back and let's let's talk a little bit about now, like, you know, going forward, we are where we are today. We have different recommendations we just went through about how we're going to deal with it. But going forward, I know that, you know that each of you have some different ideas. And Kathy, you've done the one that at least, and apologies to everybody else, but I know that you've done the most work here in having a, a solid pitch and just saying, here's a suggestion on how you guys should fix it with giving us still the most, uh, we're giving up a lot of control as the customer, but we are working within the boundaries of what you, with what you give us and being a little bit more, you know, kind of realistic or a little bit more real world and just saying, you know, hey, uh, we'll work with you, but you've got to give us this and here's a good suggestion. So why don't you talk a little bit about the suggestion that you've pitched and then maybe uh, after that, talk a little bit about the reaction that you guys have gotten. Yeah, so for me, I've been, I've been kind of seeing the writing on the wall for for a few months now. And so as I started doing that, I definitely started thinking of different ways that we could achieve what we need to while giving Microsoft the control that that they need. And so one of the things I've noticed is that I think a lot of us um, get the same requests for customizations from our customers a lot. Headers, footers, logos, custom alert areas, things like that. And that's one of the primary reasons right now that we are customizing the master page is to add in those areas. And so the proposal that kind of I've put forward is that Microsoft maintain a set of customizations in a master page that are kind of fixed down and restricted for the use of developers and UX developers. So kind of putting together basically two different master pages that they maintain, one that's maybe got the responsive bootstrap framework built into it with the controls added around the different navigation pieces and one that does not. And then also as a part of that maintaining just a simple set of blank content placeholders that are built into the master page with a set ID that then as designers and developers, we can then use JavaScript to target and inject those that it allows Microsoft to make the script changes and the additional changes they need in the master page. But for us to, to utilize those set areas that we can then put our information into it. And so it kind of gives us the control we need by giving them the control that they need at the same time. That's yeah, that's a cool suggestion though that you've got that, that you have. And so you're saying that we have using like blank content placeholders that that we could go inject stuff in, but to be clear, these are content placeholders that they would not put stuff in, only we would put it in so that we're not overriding any stuff that they're adding. If they have stuff that they want to add in, they use their own. Is that what you're saying? Correct. It would just basically give us, you know, six to eight content placeholders. I think there's probably six common branding areas that people ask for, and then two that could be utilized further by developers for additional components, but giving us kind of like six to eight blank content placeholders that have a set ID that is not changed that Microsoft does not utilize. They are just blank content placeholders in a master page set aside for customizations. And then Microsoft maintains control of the rest of the master page to add in 
their changes, their additional placeholders, their script references, whatever they need outside of those eight content placeholders. I see. So yeah, this is, it, it's similar. There, well, I shouldn't say similar, but there is something that they have that they've pitched in the, um, in the PNP uh, content. So for those of you who aren't familiar, there's a, in GitHub, uh, so github.com, there's a organization called Office Dev. So github, G-I-T-H-U-B dot com slash office dev slash P and P is in uh, Papa Nancy Papa. And in there, there is a sample that they, they talk about part of provisioning some branding assets using the client object model. It's a very developer focused thing. They do have a package that does make it a little bit easier where you can define it in, in an XML file and they'll upload those files for you. To me, that's very less ideal in the way we'd want to do the customizations, but kind of going along with what Kathy was just suggesting, there is another one where they do um, demonstrate how you can use these things called user custom actions, which essentially allow you to inject uh, a, a reference to a JavaScript file on the page. Um, that's one of two ways that I think that they're recommending that we do branding today. It's The downside to both of them is that you absolutely have to have a developer involved but it's not all that ideal. If you just want to add JavaScript, then you could do that today. But if you want to add additional things, like that's where Kathy's content placeholder idea uh, would give you a little bit more control there. So Kathy, you wanted to say something else about this real quick? Yeah, Andrew, that's exactly where this kind of evolved out of. I've been using JavaScript injection to do different things like adding in analytics and custom alerts and pieces like that already. But the problem that I've I've run into is just a basic one, like being able to add in an alert that's pulling from something. Um, you have to have a location in the page to display that. And so that's where these placeholders come into play, is using that model that they're already suggesting. So JavaScript injection kind of concept and then having something to target it to that we can then use CSS to position and style all around it. So giving us somewhere to go. And it, it really is pushing us towards um, moving away from being a pure web designer, but into uh, more of a developer role. You know, I think I really like uh, Kathy's idea for two reasons. One, I like it because it sort of draws hard lines between the areas that Microsoft can mess with and the areas that... Um, you know, we as designers can mess with. And I think that's really cool. And I also like that it's realistic. I think it's something that we could actually get, you know, in a next version of SharePoint. But, you know, I like to think of things a little bit more radically. Like, I don't know why in this day and age we're still in there mucking around with master pages and like ripping code in and out and that kind of thing. You know, I think that's kind of bullshit in a way. I think in the next version, they should rip all that out and just give us like an HTML5 type of thing where we just edit HTML5 or HTML or whatever, and then we put in one-line tokens that say, bring in the nav, bring in the footer, bring in the, you know, the search box, et cetera. And it, the idea is sort of like Design Manager, only like don't spit out a master page, just sort of do the things they need to do on the back end of that. And this would be kind of like a WordPress idea, right? And so if they had something like this, then like templates and things like that could start to flourish. And I think if they're really serious about having intranet portals that are you know heavily branded and things like that, that is something they could look at. But being a realist, I, I think that Kathy's idea is much more apt to be seen in the near future. I think that we could shoot our shoot our expectations higher and see what we get. Mark, you, you deal with uh, JavaScript all the time. I remember back in the day, you challenged me to a uh, to a branding contest where you would only use JavaScript and I would only use master page and CSS, and I never had the time for it. But like Maybe your ideas are winning out here. I did it and I won. Yeah. Oh, I didn't even show up. <laughs> uh, no, I think there. I think that there. All of these ideas are great ones, and I think that the the cool thing is that, and and I'm feeling very positive today as I texted in the chat window here. Um, it, it, it's sort of a switch for me, but I I, I think that Microsoft really is going to listen to this stuff, and and by adding all of these ideas together, and we're not the only one, you know, the people on this call are not the only ones who are going to have good ideas about this. Taking all of the great ideas that are out in the community and feeding them back into uh, the the product group, I think they're going to come up with something that's that's going to be better. We're going to have to understand though that it's not going to be the old way. It's not just going to be master pages and and custom CSS and and sort of the the, the business as usual. The, the whole platform is going to evolve into a better place. And you know, 
that that's good. I mean, Randy, you brought up Word, WordPress. I mean, I don't know how many clients I've had who just who who have said to me, "Well, why can't it just work like WordPress?" Or you know, pick pick up pick any other open source framework that anyone's ever heard of, and they ask why it won't work like that. SharePoint's been too hard to do this stuff, and it's going to get easier in Office 365. And then the hopes, of course, is that you know the learnings from the cloud come back to on premises, and everybody's better off there too. So you know. There, there are going to be changes. There are going to be big changes, and and we're going to all have to go along for the ride. Cool. Yeah. Thank. Thanks, Mark. And Jasper, you wanted to jump in and say something as well. Yeah. Sorry. I was. Uh, yeah. I'm. Uh, I'm here. I'm back again. Thanks, Randy. <laughs> <laughs> Those were deep thoughts. Deep. No problem. Deep, deep, it's, it's getting late here. <laughs> deep thoughts. Deep thoughts by Jasper. <laughs> deep thoughts. Yeah. And I made a great joke again, and nobody heard. So I'll skip that. We one. were all laughing on the inside. <laughs> yeah, I was laughing a lot here, but nobody heard. <laughs> No, I, I I do like I was saying actually there's a lot of a lot of dev talk here so it's kind of zoning out but I do I do like the idea though <laughs> just just basically for me in my role I just wish stuff would be a little bit easier it's like what Mark says like people always say why why does why can't you just move this web part zone to the left move it to the right why can't I put this object here and there it's it's just not that easy like most customers don't realize that. That you have to, you know, go into code and open up SharePoint Designer and make page layouts and move everything around. So I, I, ju I just hope eventually we get like sort of a system that makes that a little bit easier, especially for people like me who are not necessarily that technical code-wise. Um, so I think we would benefit from it because we can help the customers better, and then customers are also benefit from it because they they can get what they want. So that makes makes sense a little bit. But <laughs> I, I do like the idea though for what what Kathy is. Uh, uh, suggested. Yeah, I, I think for me, one of the things that, that I've struggled with myself and how to convey this message to my customers, and, and one of the reasons I, I spent a couple of months trying to think of this idea, and I've actually worked on trying to um, test it to see if it's feasible, because I know myself, I do a comparison of Seattle.master and SharePoint Online weekly to find out the differences. And there are differences all the time in it. But for me, the, the problem that I've run into is that, you know, for years with SharePoint and the way it's been marketed and put out there to customers is, you know, they show them that bright, shining example of Ferrari.com right? And look what you can do and look how custom you can make it and it can really look like you. And then all of a sudden with SharePoint Online, now it's a service and, you know, it, it's different and we need to adjust the way the communication and the method happens. That message goes out to the customers. But at the same time, for, for years, I know myself, I've been involved with SharePoint since the 2003 version. And even back then, we were customizing the look and feel of it. So to then all of a sudden say no customizations is a very bitter and hard pill to swallow. And so that's one of the reasons why I've, I've tried to think of this idea of to how we could kind of balance, give us as the better of both worlds. You know, each of us get something that gives, takes us a step closer to customization, but also, you know, still allows Microsoft the control that they need as they continue to learn how to deliver this product as a service. You know, it's funny you said, I didn't realize that you went all the way back to SharePoint 2003. I remember that's when I got into it. And I was um, actually, uh, Heather Solomon, who's another uh, designer in the SharePoint space, the two of us used to work together on the same team. And I remember when we rebranded our corporate portal. And I think that I had something like over a thousand files or something in 1200 files sticks in my head that we had to roll out because at the time there was no such thing as a master page. Right. And the, oh my God, that was a, incredibly challenging. And then right after we did the branding, corporate communications had a new brand for the entire company because we split off as a separate company or, or something. And it was just, it was, it was cool because we knew it was coming and we kind of showed that, you know, Heather did a phenomenal job where it was, I rolled out the brand and then we went live with the portal and then they came up with a new brand like a week later and then we shipped it out again. It was a questionable business decision by management. They said they wanted to roll the portal out and then rebrand it two weeks after we rolled it out. Um, after the first rollout was already a massive restructure of the site. So I feel for our customers, but we did a great job and it branded just fine. So cool. Well, let me ask you guys something then. Um, you know, I, I, I get the sense, I kind of serve a role here where I understand, I, I know my place, I'm more of the developer side and I know my place and I don't try and 
jump in and, and say and assume I understand what's going on in the in the UX side or, or the challenges you guys run into. I understand them, but I definitely don't want to try and I'm speaking like an expert here. But let me let me ask you guys, from my perception, I think that it was early in 2014, up until like maybe the first half of the year in 2014, there was a lot of frustration from the customer and consumer side of 365 from the changes Microsoft was making. Would that be fair to say? I think so. Yes. Okay. So we've gone from there and then now I get the sense that not just from what we're saying in this episode today, but also in the just the wider community that things are a little bit more we're, we have a little bit more of a positive outlook, or at least we don't feel as frustrated. There's a little bit more understanding from the customer side and from the Microsoft side. Would you say that's a fair, a fair characterization of where we are today? Yeah, definitely. You can. I, I, at least I have the feeling they're actually they're listening to us as well. So yeah, if, if, I do feel better that we're getting in a better spot today. I do feel a lot more comfortable too with the fact that. We, I feel like we almost have a champion on the Microsoft side, got a guy by the name of Steve Walker, which I don't think that um, all of our listeners may not be familiar with. But Steve, is a, he's been in this space for a very, very long time. And I personally am a, a very, very pleased to see him stepping up and really champion. He does a really good job of pitching or staying in the the from the, the Microsoft um, side and saying, look, here's what we need to do and how you guys need to work with us. But then he's also taken a lot of time to better understand the challenges that the customers have had and trying to figure out the best way for everybody to work together, but doing it very much on the Microsoft side. But it's I've seen a lot. He, it, he seems to really listen a lot and do a lot of really good action on getting things fixed. He was, for those of you who don't know, I mean, the things that we raised earlier in the call where the community raised issues about the sweet bar, both in the fact that some of the rendering was all screwed up and then another part where the rendering was very slow. Steve was the guy on the Microsoft side that basically lit the fires and made the bonfires to get to get shit fixed really fast, honestly. So it's, it's nice to kind of have that that champion um, on that side. Yeah, I think Steve is a great guy. And I think if you look at like the patterns and practices thing, like apparently he went to bat for us to get like alternate CSS added as something that we can control with a uh, client side code. Um, you know, he, he went to bat and said, look, people are going out there and, and customizing master pages just to put this stuff in there. You know, let's add something in there so, so that they can do it without customizing the master page. And Boom! There it is, like released out there. So I think, I think he's really out there making a difference. Um, he understands that it can't just be, uh, you know, a canned piece of software when we're talking about enterprise intranet type situations. Yeah, cool. I agree. And, that, and that, you know, another thing I don't know. Make sure that everybody is aware too. The stuff that's in P and P, that is stuff that Microsoft engineering and marketing is going to stand behind and say, we support you doing this. Um, anything that's in P and P they, they have reviewed it with engineering. Engineering has said, you know, yes, we bless this. If they say no, then there is a, a big debate on the inside about how they should fix that or how they should better deal with it. And I know that there are even things that, you know, that are not in P and P that are still churning in the background that they are still trying to figure out, look, they need this and we can't give them this right now. What kind of guidance should we give them? So they are working towards that kind of stuff. Mark, you had something you want to throw in here before we start to wrap up the show. I just wanted to make one quick comment. I think that you know the frustration early in the year versus the less frustration now, and I, I can't say that everybody's less frustrated, but is, is really around communication. It has little to do with the technology itself. It's about understanding that there's a dialogue that can actually happen where we all can work together to make it better. You know, some of the examples that you gave are were excellent ones. You know, Steve jumped on something and actually did something immediately about it. We're we're able to have these conversations. They understand better now what it is that they're when they do things, how it impacts us. And they're learning that as we go. So, you know, part of our job is to let them know, you know, when you did this, this is what happened to us. And we're trying to funnel that from all of the feedback that we get through our MVP channels. But I think if anyone else has channels that they can use to sort of get that news back to Microsoft, they really are listening and they want to they want to help us out. I totally agree. Totally agree. That's that's a really good observation, too, because you're, you're right. It, it really is about the communication channel and having those discussions going back and forth. That's the part that that's the real reason I'm calling out Steve, because Steve is the one that I feel has been the voice, has been the target and has been the voice on both sides uh, for all of this. I mean, we, we can't go into the details of it because I know there's a bunch of NDA um, stuff that's wrapped up in a bow with all the stuff that we did last week at MVP Summit. But, you know, I know that we did have a really good discussion with Steve um, as a bigger group in, in the room about understanding stuff. He's 
very good about they're very blunt about what they need about where they are and what they need to be able to do with it and then you know it, but also very responsive to feedback so first uh, thank you guys very much for jumping in on this i mean i think we've had a really good discussion here it's we've gone about almost 50 minutes now which is phenomenal i know we only went i think 18 in our last recording this is much much better for all of you that are listening, I know you probably hear a little bit of typing in the background and stuff. That's because we can't see each other. We're all on Skype recording this. And we tried to do video where we could do pitch it to each other and make sure there wasn't a lot of talking over each other. And that didn't work so well. But thankfully, on the technical side, everything did kind of come together. We did lose Mark for a few minutes, but we lost Mark, but only in spirit for just a moment. He was still always with us. He's, he's probably in the show next week again anyway, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, cool. Right, Jasper. So, okay, so let's go. Um, I got one more thing to kind of ask you guys then uh, as we wrap this up. First, uh, thank you very much for taking the time out of your day to do this. Um, but let me ask you something. We start, Chris and I, CJ and I started doing something recently about where we picked the, the biggest links and or things that are important to, to us um, today or just a cool thing. Could be a book, could be a movie, could be something technical or whatever. So, let me run around the horn. Let me get you guys to kind of throw out, you know, whatever whatever you want to do. And then you got to make sure you send me the link afterwards so I can put it in the show notes. But um, ladies first. So let me let me go ahead and start with Kathy. Kathy, do you have something you want to share what's kind of cool to you right now? Oh, that's such a tough one. Um, I, I think for me, one of the things I've been looking at lately is – I have such a wide variety of hobbies. Um, one of my hobbies that I've been, since I've been home this week, I'm a quilter. I think that comes from part of my art school background. I like to mix colors together. And so I, I started my newest quilt project this week. And so that's kind of where I am is kind of moving down that path a little bit of playing with with color in a different sense. Oh, that's cool. It's, it's nice to do stuff in the physical space, not so the technical space. I've always complained to my parents that they ask, you know, what'd you do today? Can you show me? And it's like, I am so sick of having to pull out a laptop and show you. Yeah. And it's, it's funny. My neighbors are like, why don't you have a lawn service? I'm like, because it's one of the only things I can do that I can see the result of what I did. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, it's very rewarding yeah. that way. Yeah. Yeah. Jasper, how about you? How about how, pick what's your pick this week? Yeah, n no quilting here, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 I just actually didn't have, I watched the trailer again for uh, Adventures the age of ultron and i just i just love it so much and it's it's like super geeky but it's like so funny because i i think they released a new one where they have a little bit more um you know i think they're in um, i think tony stark's house they're trying to pick up towards hammer and i'm like oh this is so much fun and i'm like i want to show it to my wife and i already know she's not gonna like it because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> She, she just doesn't care. She's like, yeah, I'll watch it with you, but you know, I'm I'm just not that excited as you are. So I'm like, I'm always the only one in the house here who's like really pumped to like watch these like new comic book trailers. So I hope when my daughter grows up, she's a little bit geeky in that way, so she can watch it with me as well. So <laughs> it's kind of my pick. <laughs> that was funny. I had, I was a little selfish and hoping that both my kids had an interest in Lego, and thankfully they both have a tremendous interest in Lego. Although I can say I never. I never played with the pink Legos when I was a kid. I do it more as an adult with my uh, five-year-old daughter, but yeah, that's a good one. Randy, how about you? Yeah, I mean, uh, my obsession is the same as it was during our Lost uh, tapes from last week, and that's the hearing that uh, Twin Peaks is coming out on Showtime in like 2016. I've been kind of going back and watching all the old ones, and uh, you know, I just I can't believe that this was a popular phenomenon in the 90s. I think it may have had to do with there only being like three TV channels. <laughs> <laughs> but like it's like a weird twist on like a soap opera, but also like super dark with like fever dreams of backwards talking and things like this. I, I love it, though. I think everybody should go out and watch it. It's great. It's on Netflix. <laughs> really good. That's really good. How about you, Mark? Uh, I don't know what what you guys are all talking about. This real life. Stuff. What is not everything about SharePoint and code and things like that? I mean, I don't I'm very confused. Nerd alert. So, so my answer is going to be the same. <laughs> my answer is going to be the same as it was before. Actually, when we lost the recording, too. I, I, I want to look into, and, and you guys have to tell me which one it is again. I want to look into less and or SAS. Which one's the one I'm supposed to do? SAS. SAS is newer. SAS. Okay, so I'm going to be looking into SAS, and that's S A S S. In case you've used all the other software products that have that <laughs> that sound to them. Um, and it helps with uh, sort of variable uh, driven CSS, which I think just sounds so cool. I actually invented it about five years ago, but never wrote it. So I guess I lose. If it wasn't on Hacker News, it didn't happen. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and it's free anyways. You wouldn't have made any money on it. 
Oh, I, I make unbelievable amounts of money giving away free software, though. There you go. <laughs> yeah, Mark's SP Services has got a phenomenal warranty and money back plan to it. It does. <laughs> you don't like it, he'll send you everything back that you paid for. Unless 365 broke it, then he doesn't want to hear about it. I, I don't even. I don't even make you pay the shipping charges, which I think you know is very generous. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. So I, I think that my link uh, this week is going to have to be the thing that dragged uh, our uh, my co-host away, Chris Johnson, which is the open sourcing of .NET. That I got a text like within about ten minutes of our of us supposed to sit down and record this, and he's like, "Hey, can you do the show solo today? Uh, there's stuff that's crazy today with uh, the open sourcing of .NET and visual, giving Visual Studio away to small teams and etc." So, if uh, people are interested by now, I think the probably the inner tubes have calmed down a bit. I know we couldn't even get to Scott Hanselman's blog um, about an hour and a half ago, um, just getting overloaded with the stuff that he had published. Guys, thank you very much. Kathy, Mark, Randy, Jasper, I really appreciate you guys taking time again to sit down with me and talk about this. I know this time it's in the comfort of our of our homes or our works, but um, this time we uh, uh, got a lot more out of this episode. So hopefully uh, our listeners got a lot out of it as well. And um, definitely, again, I appreciate your time and all of your insight and your experience that you shared today. I really Thanks hope for you press the record button, Andrew. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I agree. Don't screw this up, buddy. Hey, man, I, I've been watching. It shows that it's been recording the whole time. So I'm, I'm crossing my fingers here. We should be good. <laughs> all right, cool. Thanks a lot, guys. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Hey, guys. If you have a question for us, go to microsoftcloudshow.com slash questions, where you can submit it as text or we'll record it as a WAV or an MP3 file and provide a link so that we can play your question on the show. Our theme music is an excerpt from Evaporated Eric by Monk Turner used under Creative Commons. You can subscribe to us in iTunes by searching for the Microsoft Cloud Show or via RSS at microsoftcloudshow.com, where you'll also find a full transcript and show notes of each episode. You can find us on Facebook searching for the Microsoft Cloud Show or on Twitter at MS Cloud Show. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.